Good evening. Just a, um, a couple of housekeeping items. We are uh, videotaping tonight's presentation and our uh, videographer may actually pan the crowd. If there's anybody who has an issue with being seen on, Marty, you have no problem being seen on TV. Um, <laughs> Being, see, being seen on PCTV, we're going to be uh, yes. uh, running this uh, program on PCTV a number of times, so um, just a forewarning. Um, welcome, my name is Barney Auersler. I'm Executive Director of Pittsburgh United, and I'm allowed to play around a little bit with the Clean Rivers campaign. Uh, the <laughs> campaign uh, director had scheduled a vacation of all places in Hawaii when it's getting to be beautiful here. Uh, and Jenny normally has the honor of welcoming folks to these speaker series. Um, but the Beyond Tunnel Vision series, uh, we have really uh, had an expectation that it would be an opportunity for us to hear from the experience around the country uh, of similar communities to Pittsburgh and Allegheny County that are struggling with these same issues of dealing with a badly or wrongly designed sewer system from a long time ago. And it struck us in the work we've done in changing development in Pittsburgh through Pittsburgh United campaigns, we spent some time getting future stormwater put back into the ground or into the air in a campaign to make future development in the city of Pittsburgh uh, deal with the stormwater issue by putting it, keeping it out of the sewers and the stormwater organizations in our coalition that won that fight pointed out that Alcasan was facing uh, the biggest investment in this region's history, perhaps ever, that we'll make. And that we really should look at what could we benefit from in that massive public investment in the billions of dollars. And one of the issues that we had found very quickly was that there are a lot of reasons why you can't do it in Pittsburgh. And those reasons turn out to be, we felt, would turn out to be things that were more of an opportunity than a barrier to doing large-scale green infrastructure as part of the solution for stopping stormwater flooding into our, uh, with sewers flooding into our rivers. And so we asked a number of people from around the country to come and share their experience, how they have addressed this issue, what their planning is, what their experience is. And tonight we have with us uh, someone that um, I almost kiddingly uh, call the rock star of sewers. Um, George is willing to fess up to that on his good days. Um, he prefers that to some of the other things he gets called as the head of the DC water operation, which is sort of like being Jim Good, who, who is here from PWSA, uh, and also being Arletta uh, Scott Williams, who's the head of Alcasan, because George's operation does both water and sewer for DC and does sewer for several counties actually bringing in both Maryland and Virginia into his operation. So he does stuff on a scale that's at least equal to ours in both Alcasan and the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, and what I found when I met him two years ago at uh, an event in Philadelphia was that there was an imagination of what's possible with George that there was an excitement about what we might be able to do, but it was coupled with a hard-nosed attitude that says, hey, you know, there's some things we've got to do. We've got to meet water standards, but what else could we do? And so we were very excited when he agreed to come and spend some time with us. Uh, he's been touring around to various um, uh, important organizations working on this for, uh, for our futures. Um, met with PWSA today met with Darla Cravada, who's also here with us tonight, who uh, Rich Fitzgerald, our county executive, has asked to spearhead the county's work on this. Um, he will be meeting with uh, the mayoral candidates, key staff, uh, and a number of other folks um, as we move this campaign forward. But the Clean Rivers campaign is really uh, trying to pose the question of what can we get from this biggest investment in our region's history? What could we get the most out of uh, in terms of this investment? So um, I also just want to quickly say that we have uh, one of our veterans of these speaker series is, is our uh, county councilwoman, Barbara Daly Danko. She's made it to at least three of them that I remember seeing her at. So she's learning a lot from the county council perspective. Um, and we have uh, two members of the County Board of Health. And the County Board of Health 
Uh, this is uh, Jorlette Portlock and Ellen Stewart. The uh, County uh, Board of Health is one of the, the partners in the consent decree for the Alcasan and the consent order for the City of Pittsburgh. So the County Board of Health is playing an important role in this and we appreciate their coming tonight to learn from what's happening in DC. And we have a couple troublemakers from Swissvale. We have Daryl Rapp and Marty O'Malley, the mayor of Forest Hills, uh, who are uh, uh, advocates for doing as much green as we can do. So with that, uh, welcome tonight, and please welcome uh, George to us. I'm going to start with a story connected to a young boy. He was in fourth grade. It was a nice fall day from a big elementary school, public elementary school. Took a bus trip from the school down into a major American city and then down a second hill down to the area along a river in the middle of that city. When the bus had left the school, the sun was out. It was a warm fall day. It was a day everybody wanted to be outside. He wanted to be outside. When the bus let these kids off, including this young boy, the air had gotten dark and heavy, smelled terrible. And the boy, before he went on, looked up at the bus driver, said, sir, what's that smell in the air? And the bus driver tapped the little boy on the head he said, my son, that is the sweet smell of success. I tell you that story because that boy was me. The year was 1969. I went to Fairfax Elementary School in Cleveland Heights, Ohio. And we took a trip down to the flats along the Cuyahoga River in the center of Cleveland. Now, I must say, I grew up not particularly liking Pittsburgh. <laughs> Your teams beat our teams too often, in my opinion. <laughs> Nonetheless, there's a heck of a lot about Cleveland and Pittsburgh that are the same. They, these are cities that were the industrial heartland that built this country and much of the world after World War II. Most people don't know the sheer scale of the economic powerhouse that were in cities like Cleveland and Pittsburgh and Detroit, as all of a sudden all the returning veterans from World War II started making families and wanting washing machines and cars and getting houses out now into these new suburbs which hadn't existed before the war. And that production came from these places, changed the world in which we live in ways we can barely remember. I am old enough, and some of us are, I remember the first TV we had in the 60s. It had a tiny little screen in this gigantic box. It was like my phone in this. <laughs> and when you turned it on, it took a long time to light up. You had three shows on, three the networks, and then when you turn it off, it went Remember that? At the end of the night, which was 11 o'clock, they had the national anthem and the flag in the background and everything was off. But all that had to be built, it didn't exist before the cities of the heartland of America built it all. But the idea was, if we were all going to enjoy all of that industrial output, you had to accept the consequence. And I won't speak for the city of Pittsburgh, because I wasn't here then, but I was downtown Cleveland, 1969, and it was unbelievable, the scale of pollution that existed along the flats of Cleveland, which like Pittsburgh, with steel mills, iron ore coming off Lake Superior, easy access to coal, center of the country, standard oil in Cleveland, you got US steel here. It's just an incredible story about what was happening in these two cities. But you couldn't see from one end of the street to another. The air was, if you couldn't get away from it, the air was so heavy. But I do remember walking over and looking down into the Cuyahoga. And the best analogy I can give to what the river looked like was finger painting. I actually don't know whether kids do that anymore, but when we were kids, you'd put all the paints and you'd smoosh it all around this. That's what the water looked like. It was visibly colorful. And most of you may know that in 1969, a train car going over the Cuyahoga River, a spark, they think, 
from the wheel of the car, went down to the river, ignited it on fire, and it burned for a week. How about that for a pollution control mechanism? <laughs> Throw a match in the water. That's unbelievable. We were staggered as fourth graders at the scale of the pollution that was in our cities. We all went back and wrote letters to President Nixon. I still have mine. I didn't know I had mine. My mom kept it. It was in those, that paper with, you know, you write the really big words. But I wrote, I wrote about air pollution, because while I remember the water pollution, as soon as you walked away from the river, you didn't see it anymore. The air you couldn't get away from. It was everywhere around you as you walked. But all of us knew as fourth graders, there's something wrong here. This must change. And what I would argue is that society felt that as these stories became public, whether it was pollution on the Hudson, the Cuyahoga River igniting on fire, Times Beach, Love Canal, any of these stories dramatic about pollutants. We as a populace got together on a reasonably bipartisan basis and decided this will not stand. And the reason I'm standing here today is first because that happened. I have had a connection to environmental issues ever since. It seems darn important to me to make sure that the world we live in is healthy for us. It's not an add-on. It is for our own well-being and every other living organism, and it matters. But the other issue that I'm here is because what we've done since then. A major message in the talk today is how I think right now the world around us, the legal world around us, the landscape around us, the manner in which we organize ourselves as people is changing as we speak, perhaps as much right now as it was after the war and into the 60s with this boom that occurred with the baby boom, right now, around us. And the question is, are we going to grasp the opportunity that gives us or not? It's our time. But it's built on a victory. And what I want to say before anything else, because I'm going to suggest change is afoot, it's change based on victory, not failure. Because what that pollution was in the Cuyahoga, and I think of the crazy things we did as kids growing up. I don't know about you folks from Pittsburgh, but in Cleveland back then, we had untreated waste coming from big sewer lines. There's the Emerald Necklace, a bunch of parks that surround Cleveland. They were in Cleveland Heights and Shaker Heights. We used to go to the park, and we would go into the sewer pipes, because they were completely untreated, and see how far we could dare ourselves to go deep inside underneath <laughs> the city. I remember swimming in part of the sewer system, because it was right there. Dodge, dodge, I'm going to say what? I remember going to Lake Erie, and the first kid out knocked a dead fish out of the way so the next kid could go into the water, and I wonder why I have no memory. <laughs> the chemicals did it, I'm telling you. Somebody ought to be in trouble. But we were used to that, but knew it was wrong. And what happened were the 1972 amendments to the Federal Water Pollution Control Act. The Federal Water Pollution Control Act had been around since the 50s was a remarkable failure because of what it did not do. It allowed a long understanding of figuring out what the water body could handle, and you had to work backwards to the discharger, and maybe you could figure out what they could or could not discharge. And what Edmund Muskie in the Senate pushed was, wait a minute, we actually have an example of how this works. It's called the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899, and what it says is, in that statute, you may not discharge into the harbors of the United States because it's not healthy for the harbors, we can't navigate. And a boat couldn't say, there's no other boats around. It's not going to be a problem in this harbor. It's so big. It just prohibited an act that was considered to be dangerous from the discharge point, not looking at it from the water body and needing to prove that it's dangerous. It's a technology-based standard issued in a permit. That came in in 1972. What you may not know is that the original version of the bill was vetoed and then passed over the veto with those provisions intact. And what that put in place, in my judgment, is the best success story of progressive government in modern times. And I mean that sincerely and absolutely. You look at the problems of the Cuyahoga River igniting on fire. They did a fish count in the 60s in the Cuyahoga River, and they found 10. <laughs> Not 10 species, 10 fish in the river. Today, 
they do a fish count in the Cuyahoga River. It's not perfect. There's a lot of, of pollutants to make up for. They find 60 species of fish swimming in the Cuyahoga River. That is because we put a system in place that did not allow the practices, and we paid for it. Those prices have to be passed on through the price of products and all the rest, but we all decided that was important enough for us to do that. That was the time, that was their effort, and they stood tall and did what was necessary. And today we reap those benefits. You couldn't be in Center City, Cleveland with that kind of stinky river today. You wouldn't have the renaissance you've had in Pittsburgh if you still had rivers like that. We benefit today from the decisions that were made, tough decisions, back then. But in my judgment, times are changing, and I'll come back to why. But remember this great victory and those who stood tall. The second issue of changing times, I would connect to Washington. You know, for the longest time when I, early in my environmental career, almost all of what I was doing was trying to stop sprawl. We know it in Pennsylvania. I did my work in New Jersey. Pennsylvania is set up just like New Jersey or vice versa. Tons of little municipalities, each making their own decisions, Good people at night, usually volunteers, hundreds of municipalities. Yet what had happened in New Jersey, which I can speak very knowledgeably about, I think this is very similar to Pennsylvania, is the cities were abandoned. That's where a lot of old industry was done. You think of New Jersey and industry? Yep, just like Pittsburgh, just like that's is where we built America. Let's get out of town. Let's leave Trenton. Let's leave Camden. Let's leave Elizabeth and spread out over the landscape. Mercer County in the center of New Jersey, the population didn't go up. The amount of land people lived on went up by five as we spread out over the landscape. And what we kept on saying was if we keep on spreading out over the landscape, spreading out into forest areas, farmland areas, we have consequence of whether we're going to be able to grow our own food in the future. The water quality issues that go along with taking open land and putting roadways on it and all the runoff that occurs, the amount of car exhaust that's created, energy, new, it's bad for finances because you got to build new firehouses and new schools as you spread out into new, you leave the old ones behind as their tax base drops and then all of a sudden you've got all the urban problems of what's left back. So this problem was just creating this whole suite of issues. We kept on saying we got to try to hold back sprawl. Now I left a watershed group that I worked at in New Jersey for seven years. Even though we got pretty successful at stopping sprawling development. Because in fact, what I realized was happening is we stopped it in New Jersey. This is right around central Jersey. It was popping up in Bucks County in Pennsylvania right across the Delaware. So we had stopped it in one place, but it just popped up somewhere else, which meant in the biggest picture of the, of the ecology or the economy, we weren't really succeeding. We were just displacing. And generally speaking, we were displacing it from areas that had economic firepower, like the area around Princeton, which is where we were located, to areas that didn't. There's a challenge in that on a whole slew of levels. But I left the watershed, not because I didn't love it. It was a fantastic organization. But what I really came to the conclusion was we have to know not only what we do not want, we have to know what we want. Where do we want the houses that we're going to stomp out in the hinterlands to go? Where do we want the businesses to go? Where do we want all of that development to go rather than where we just don't want? And we don't want it in stream sides. We don't want it in critical farmlands. There are things we don't want to have happen. But we need to know the positive answer or else just as bad a decision will be made somewhere else. And to me, the answer was as clear as a day when it finally came to me. And it came to me because others told me, was cities. It's incredible the degree to which urban redevelopment answers almost every environmental, community, and financial question that we have before us today. Straight down the line. Are you worried about global warming? Well, a large part of global warming is the sheer amount of fossil fuel we use in these far-flung developments where it takes an hour to drive from where you work to where you live and from where you live to where you work and the church and the store. We've spread ourselves out over the landscape. We spend so much time in traffic, the amount of electricity it takes. The average house, single-family house in a suburb uses this much energy. The amount of green energy a greenhouse in a suburb uses this much energy. Any house in a city uses this much energy and a greenhouse in a city uses even less 
I live in an apartment or a townhouse in the city like I have. I help keep my neighbor, they help me. It's almost always going to be smaller. I walk to the metro, I walk to the store. Why? Because I can. When I lived in the suburb in New Jersey, I couldn't walk to a store. There wasn't one nearby. And to get it, I had to cross Route 1 and take my life in my hands. You have to go by car everywhere. We had organized ourselves in a way that was auto-dependent, carbon producing, eating up habitat, taking our farmland. Taxes are going up in New Jersey and Pennsylvania everywhere because all these new communities, as I mentioned, need all this new infrastructure. While you leave the old ones behind, you're still subsidizing. The jobs are out here. The people who need them are over here. Almost every problem is in the landscape. You move back to the city where the infrastructure already is. People can walk more. They ride their bikes more. They get to know their neighbors. They can be healthier. Their footprint is shorter. They use less fossil fuels. They use less energy. And guess what? It's a heck of a lot of fun to live in a city once you hit the critical mass. So that second reality, I think, that is before us, the first is that we've had this great victory, but change is afoot. The second is that urban redevelopment is a central solution to almost every problem we face. Not them all, but a whole slew of them. So the third is, how do we make it happen? And that's where we come to Pittsburgh and today. Now let me, and Washington, D.C., and New York, and Boston, and Kansas City, and Cleveland, and Philadelphia, cities all over the country are, are asking this same question. Before I go any farther, let me just quickly say something quickly about your city. You've got a gorgeous city. I walked it the last time I visited. I hadn't been to Pittsburgh much. Like I said, it was sort of hard that first trip. <laughs> but I'm over it. It's a spectacular city. You've got everything here. And in fact, for the population in the city itself, it's amazing the scale of what you've got relative to the number of major museums, the arts that you have, the gorgeous architecture. I think every great city has rivers and water bodies. It's a fundamental aspect of any great city, in my hum humble opinion. Variety of architecture, open space, trees all over the place. This topography, which allows you to see from some places so many others. It's really a beautiful city. And the question is, how do we keep the momentum of drawing people back into the city? Both for Pittsburgh, and I don't mean this too competitively, but in competition with other cities. That movie where the oil guy, Daniel Day-Lewis, says, I'm going to drink your milkshake. I know Pittsburgh is trying to grow with eds and meds. Lots of cities are. The question is, which of us are going to make it? Which of us are going to make it as cities? And those that can attract this generation. And what's happened in Washington, I'll tell you about Washington, is it's finally worked. We always said at some point, Everyone is going to be sick living out in Timbuktu, driving an hour and a half every day just to go to a job and pick up their kids and get something from the store. It's just, living is too hard. I grew up in Cleveland Heights, the inner ring suburb. There were 62 kids on my street. The way we played sports is we walked out our front door. We had our own baseball team, our own softball team, our own football team, our own blood ball team, which would not be allowed today. <laughs> But it was so much fun way to work. I rode the bike to the church down the street. I learned to wrestle at the Y. We went to the uh, Shaker Lakes where we swam with all that other stuff in the water. We had a church that, and, a, and a church school down the way, but they had a pond. It would freeze in the winter. We'd ice skate. And we didn't drive anywhere. It was all by foot. We as kids organized ourselves. It was such a great way to live. And it was so less taxing on our parents. And it was all because of the manner in which we lived in. And I just expected that at some point, this far-flung notion, it sounds great, but good Lord, is it hard on parents. And good Lord, is it hard on kids, because you're so isolated from everybody else. And guess what? In DC, it's happened. And maybe it's happened because we got some of it pretty bad. Traffic around Washington, DC is horrendous. And if you don't have to take the beltway, or come in on any of the major roads, why would you ever do it? I'm a pretty friendly, easygoing guy, and I become an ax murderer every time I drive in and out of DC. I was actually very glad to have my first meeting so early this morning, because I left at 4.30 AM to get here, and I was happy. i am beat traffic. I wouldn't do anything to beat traffic. I get to the beach in the middle of the night to beat traffic. Everybody, the younger generation in particular, they don't want to live out in the hinterlands. They want to come into the city. They're the ones building all these new businesses. 
They want to be able to walk to the store, see their friends, go to a restaurant. That's the vibrant part of a city that we've got to build on. So now the third question is, how are we going to do it? Pittsburgh's got great fundamentals, so does Washington. We're in competition, I hope friendly competition. And what you have before you, and this is what Barney said, and it's breathtaking, but amazing is probably the largest single public investment that will be made in Pittsburgh in our, anybody in this room's generation. That's amazing. It really is amazing. You hear about a huge expenditure nationwide. The president is going to put money into the transportation fund. He's going to put $500 million in it for the whole country. You're going to spend more than that money here in the next 10 years, over some period of time, right before us. And guess what? We can decide what's the best outcome for that money. And we face the same exact question in Washington. New York faces it, Philadelphia, Cleveland, Kansas City, the whole nine yards. And it stems from a problem. I don't need to spend a lot of time on it because some of you, um, maybe all of you already know the combined sewer problem we have in our old cities. Yes, it's a poor design. It was a heck of a lot better than what was there beforehand. In Washington, D.C., sewage used to flow into an open canal that went parallel to what is now the mall along Constitution Avenue, untreated, and discharged to the Potomac. It was one of the smelliest cities in the United States because the sewage went right smack through the middle of it. In comparison to that, a combined sewer is pretty darn good. And as we know, what a combined sewer is, is a sewer that takes the sewage and sanitary flow from a dwelling into the same pipe that flow from the street goes into. So you walk down the street and it's raining and you see all that water flowing into a storm drain. Most of us never think, well, where does it go? It's like magic. It goes into the street. Well, in 750 cities in the United States of America, the, the, the pipes were designed to take that storm and the sewage into the same pipe, combined sewer systems. It was a heck of a lot better that was there than what was there before. The problem is, is that no matter how big that pipe is, and we've got some huge combined sewer pipes in Washington, the one that flooded four times last summer, putting sewage into people's basements and on the streets, at its end is 22 feet in interior diameter. That's like this ceiling. That's like those movies where you drive a truck through it, and it's not big enough to handle the flow of some of the storms we're getting. In that case, the design is to allow the blow off, the overflow to go directly to the rivers. It's better than going back into basements, going back into streets. It is a terrible outcome if we can solve it. So the question before us all is how to solve combined sewage. Now I would say there's three basic answers. And the debate before us, as you know, because that's what the Clean Rivers Project is doing so well. By the way, we call our project the Clean Rivers Project. So that's great, because that is why we're doing this. We have to tie it back to water quality. And there are strong attributes for each option. So one of the things that I will be clear about is I don't think there's any one that's, that's negative or terrible. There's positives about every option. And the question is, however, are we clear about which options we select before we make the investment of a generation? By the way, I just hired a new CFO. We brought him down from New York from 20 years of municipal bond experience, both for New York City and for the big investment houses in New York. And he says, you know, it's not uncommon now to float 100-year bonds. I mean, the standard municipal bond is 30 years. Because these assets will last 100 years. The water main that broke on Saturday morning at 4 a.m. this past weekend in Washington, D.C., that I got the call on because it flooded water down 17th Street into the Mayflower Hotel's basement, was installed in 1897. And that's not bad for age in Washington, D.C. I got pipes in the district that were put in before the Civil War. Before the Civil War. I don't even like thinking who put them in or under what circumstances. But that's the kind of systems we have in these cities. Now, one of the options to solve this problem is what is called the gray option. And to me, it is the epitome of the kinds of solutions we put in place to solve the problems of the burning Cuyahoga River. 
very technology oriented, very much ordered to pipes, solutions underground, and very clear in what its benefits are under the control of an authority like mine. In Washington, D.C., we have that solution in consent decree, just like you do in Pittsburgh. Estimated to cost $2.6 billion. And it will build a tunnel, three tunnels, actually, in Washington. They are the first one we are building now. It is 22 feet interior diameter the whole way. Starts down at Blue Plains. We run the largest advanced wastewater treatment plant in the world. We treat 330 million gallons of wastewater, or I call it enriched water, because it is valuable to us, every day, which is equivalent of taking Three Rivers Stadium and filling it to the rafters, and then treating that every day, day after day after day. That's how big this facility is. But we're starting a 22-foot tunnel. It starts 10 stories underground. And we're going to drill it up the Potomac River. We're going to take a right turn into the Anacostia up to the Potomac, uh, up to Poplar Point, which is across from the baseball park. Take a second phase up to RFK Stadium. Take a third phase into Northeast Washington. That'll cost about $1.6 billion. That's the classic gray solution. Other than the construction of it, no one will see it. It's deep underground. It works well. We know exactly its performance, and we maintain it. So there are positive attributes to gray. Do you want to know how much stormwater it will capture? I can't personally do the math, but the diameter, circumference, time, length, something along those lines. You can figure out the volume exactly of how much we can capture in the system. So there are benefits to gray. There are huge challenges with gray. Our customers don't get it. They don't see it. The cost is enormous. Our water rates have gone doubled since I've been in the job, doubled. And they're going to go up every year we can project for the next two decades. And most of what we will put, if it's tunnels, our customers will never see. And there's a large portion of our customers who are very poor, low income, fixed income seniors, who for $5 more a month, let alone doubling, they don't have the funds to do it. And almost none of our customers know what the heck we do because they've never thought about it before. It's one of the victories of our organizations. If we're good at it, you don't wonder where your water comes on when you turn on the spigot in the morning or where it goes when it goes down the drain. You're just confident that it works. That is an amazing outcome. And that is because authorities like mine, and I haven't been part of it very long, I have tremendous respect for the people in this industry. The fact that we can deliver fresh, clean water to every dwelling in Washington, D.C., every minute of every day is incredible. And then once it's used, take it back, however you use it, and we will clean it before it goes back to the Potomac, which is where it came from in the first place. It'll be cleaner when it hits the river than the river itself. That's amazing. 1,300 miles of water mains, 37,000 valves, 9,136 fire hydrants, nine pump stations, eight reservoirs, four above ground tanks. That's all part of this enormously complex system that we run, and you've got one in this city. And it's run so well, you hardly think about it. On the other hand, when we raise our rates, and they're now $78, when I got in the job, it was 40. Our customers are shocked. No surprise, 40 to 78, that's a big jump per month. On the other hand, that barely touches the scale of my cell phone bill. I have two teenagers. Nonetheless, it doesn't touch my cable bill, a lot less than electricity. And yet if you ask almost anyone, I was talking to someone at Pepco, the energy company in our area, we really feel sorry for you when, water, when something happens with the infrastructure. I said, really? Because everyone complains about energy being out. I said, well, when energy's out, people know what to do. It's happened before, used batteries, candles, don't open up the freezer. When water is out, it's an instant catastrophe. You wake up in the morning and no water comes out of your spigot, your toilet doesn't flush, there's no way to cook. You don't know what to give your kids. It's an immediate crisis. We have customers who don't think about us at all. And then we are the most important thing on their list, and they're mad. And then it goes back to, what was I just calling? I forget, because it all comes back on like magic. My judgment is if we don't have a more personal relationship with the people we serve, we will never get through the rate increases necessary to do billion dollar projects. At some point, the money spigot will be turned off, not because there isn't a justification for it, just people won't get it. And you know what happens to authorities like mine when that happens? And this is what's been happening for decades. 
you always do the work that must be done by law. You have a consent decree, I have a consent decree. You got permits, I got permits. That work always comes first, it's mandated. What do you scrimp and save on if you don't get revenue that you need? The water mains, the sewer lines, the pump stations, the valves, the fire hydrants. The apparatus that you care about and matters to you on a day-to-day -day basis the most is what's aging and falling apart because that's where we steal money from to do the mandated projects if we cannot persuade our ratepayers of the meaning and worth of a billion dollar investment. So just remember, the first one was gray. It has good attributes. We know where it is. We know how it works. But there's this new one that, that you're looking at here and that we're looking at in the district, green infrastructure. The core problem here is capturing stormwater so it doesn't go in the pipe, overload it, and cause the overflow of sewage into the river. So stormwater capture is the bottom line. A tunnel is a very clear and distinct way to do that. But what if we dispersed our relationship with stormwater management and had all of us become part of it, even more than a rain barrel? Every roof is a possibility of, of collecting rainwater. Every street is a possibility of collecting rainwater. Every median strip, every alley, every parking garage can have a few spaces taken out to put bladders underground. That's happening in the district. There's so many different ways that we can start using the landscape around us to capture water that will achieve the same goal. But then think of the other benefits that come with it. And of course, you've heard this in the other presentations. To some of you, I'm just repeating what you've already heard. But the benefits are very meaningful. We're changing the landscape at the public level. It is adding. Trees are one of the best stormwater management system in, of all. Have you ever, you know, you walk into a forest when it's raining? You always hear the rain before you feel it? Because most of the rain never gets to the ground. It's being held up in the tree canopy. 80 to 90% of the rain in a forest never hits the ground because it's held in the leaf and then evaporates right back up in the system. Planted trees is a great stormwater management system. And then they absorb water with their roofs, another great stormwater management system. Having trees, and you have a lot of them in Pittsburgh, it's what, one of the beautiful things about your, your city, is a great way to do it. Then the question is, how do we get, in Washington, we're all worried, how do the trees survive? Haven't you wondered, you walk down a busy street, you see it's concrete on one, the street on one side, the sidewalk on the other, then there's this type, huge tree with this little tiny place where the tree comes from. Like, how does the water get down there? And that's actually a huge problem for urban trees, how to keep them alive when so much of the land around them is covered with concrete. We can redesign that. We can take the water that's infiltrating and we don't want to go into the pipe so it overflows into the tree boxes so it gets to the trees and then from there, moving slowly, it ends up getting into the system. But after the storm has gone by, so the existing sewer can handle the flow rather than at that peak when everything is rushing into the system. We can design that. So we improve our tree canopy. Washington, D.C., I always walk down the side of the street with the trees that are not it's too hot. Energy savings, every one of these things that control stormwater reduces heat island effect, can reduce heating costs in buildings. It's amazing the benefits we get on the energy side. Habitat that it adds in the city, the jobs that are created. This is a big controversy in D.C. I'm under fire a lot for it, justifiably so, of what kind of jobs are connected to the big engineering comp firms and companies. And I love these firms, I have no problem with big engineering. But most of their employees go from big project to big project. They're specialists in deep underground drilling. This tunnel we're building, and we are building one of the tunnels, the big one I mentioned, that machine is more than a football field in length. It's mammoth. It costs $30 million built in Germany shipped in pieces to Baltimore, they bring it down, the cutter blade, we just, actually we named it. <laughs> we named it the cutter blade Lady Bird, after Lady Bird Johnson, who got her husband to say the Potomac was a national disgrace. But that thing is gonna be put down underground, and the machinery and the sophistication and the high engineering of that project means not that many unemployed people in the district who need a job and we're in neighborhoods where most of the money is coming from to pay for the job, are gonna have access to those positions in a deep underground drilling project. Now, we're always gonna have big engineering. We're always gonna rely on our very good friends in the big engineering world. But if we're redesigning streets, 
bioswales, alleys, roofs, tree boxes, all the mechanisms that we need to handle water on the surface. Those are jobs that are accessible to the people who live in our cities and who can be trained in those jobs. Let me tell you one other story very quickly. When I first got to the district in the latest, about 78 years now I've been in the district, this latest go around, and I used to run the Department of Environment for Washington. And my first big challenge was the parking lots for the new Nationals baseball stadium. Any of you have been there, it's a stadium built right on the water. First lead certified stadium in the country, by the way. But the Anacostia is right behind it, and there was 19 parking lots being designed for this, all the cars coming to a baseball game. And so the question was, are we going to do stormwater management for those parking lots? And I was like, I am the new director of the Department of Environment. We are going to do stormwater management. And I'd go into these meetings about how we were going to do this and if we were going to do it and from the learners, who I really like. But they would come in, and one of the guys had this thing in his hand, like calling balls and strikes. But it was the days, hours, and minutes to opening day. Mr. Hawkins, are you going to stop baseball in Washington, D.C.? Because the people can't park, they can't come to the game. And I said, I am absolutely confident that we have the creativity and ability to put stormwater management on these parking spaces. Fortunately, the mayor backed me, and there is now stormwater management on all of those parking lots. But let me tell you another story. Because I was living down by the ballpark for several years, and I was walking to the metro, and there was this little tractor it was sitting, I was watching it for a while, trying to figure out what it was doing. Because it was digging at the side of the parking lot. And as I walked up and started looking at it, I realized the parking lot has a slight incline to it, so that the water that hits the rain comes off the parking lot and went into a bioswale where it was going to infiltrate into the ground. That's one of these green infrastructure designs. But as it worked over time, it was taking silt and other material off the lot, and it had filled in silt. That is expected. But if you don't dig it out, it stops working. The water will just keep right on going over the, over the lip and back into the storm drain so the LID doesn't achieve its purpose. Someone several years after it's installed has got to come back and maintain it. Someone sat in that tractor and was doing the work. Another great job opportunity that's forever into the future. So we have a gray option some very distinct benefits. We have a green option, some very distinct benefits. And the time is now, like it was back in the 70s for a different group of people, the time is our time to make this unbelievably huge public decision about how billions of dollars of our money, not somebody else's money, this isn't federal tax money, this is our ratepayer money that's going to pay for these projects. And how are we going to spend it? Now, my belief is that green infrastructure will work. But I want to tell you, belief isn't enough. We've got to know it's going to work at some level of certainty. Because my fiduciary duty is to DC water. We're on the hook for the discharges that go into the Potomac, the Rock Creek, and the Anacostia. So if it doesn't work, we'll be in trouble and have to do something else. So for our ratepayers, my belief that green development can work has got to be translated to the kind of engineering certainty that we would have with a tunnel. So what we have done in the district is ask the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, where I used to work, and the U.S. Department of Justice for the flexibility to do a full-scale pilot at $30 million where we will monitor whether we can install it, we can build it, whether we can maintain it. And what I ask my engineers to do is do this project just like you would do any other project. What is every operational decision you need answered? What kind of equipment do we need to maintain it? OK, what is it? Where are we going to put it? Who's going to maintain it and clean it? Who are the people who are going to work in it? What agency are they going to work for? What's their job description? How much pay do they need? What kind of revenue do we have? How often do we clean these things? How many do we need? If we scale it up, I want to have a certainty in how we answer those questions for the green outcome. Because the challenge with green is it's dispersed. It's not DC water now building the tunnel, and it's our tunnel. We maintain it. We inspect it. It's all of you building things. And it's the city doing things in the street. 
It's all sorts of people coming together. I personally think that sounds wonderful, but it also means it's people that I don't directly control. I can't call them into a meeting and say, why is this on time or not on time or what's going on? No, it's a whole group dispersed into the community. So we need to have a strong answers to the questions and challenges that come from a dispersed system as we would have for a centralized system. And that is what our pilot is designed to find out. We have something called the 025 plus plan. It's too much for some areas to go all the way from gray, and I think that's pretty much what Pittsburgh is looking at now, to all the way to green in one jump. It's a billion dollar investment. I won't do that in DC, even though I personally believe green is gonna work. But what I am willing to do, if, D if EPA will let, allow us, is to have a staged deferral of two of the three tunnels, because we're, like I said, we're building one of them, while we do a full-scale pilot, I'm talking about millions of dollars, everybody watching, transparency on cost, maintenance, performance, capture, any of the questions we're asking, everybody's gonna be at the table watching the solutions to these questions as we get the answers. And if, as I hope, we get good answers to it, that will lead to a second, much bigger project. I'm talking about the biggest public project at the surface ever seen in Washington, D.C. We might spend a billion dollars transforming streets throughout the city to capture drain water in ways that are gonna make the streets better, greener, cleaner, cooler, if we can prove it works. So the question before us is do we have the time to do this test for a hundred years of infrastructure, the decision we're making. Some say, well, it's going to take too long. Don't delay. We're making a hundred, a century old decision. This, these tunnels, if we build them, and we are building some of them, they're going to be there a long time. We hope it's like Rome. A thousand years from now, our tunnels will be down there and still working. So taking a few extra years before we spend the single biggest chunk of your money or our ratepayers' money in the district is well worth the time if the potential outcome could change the city so dramatically. Now if I come back around, and this is a little bit competitive, remember, you all are competing for the next generation of businesses. What we have found in the district where green development is taking off independent of agencies or government because the private developers have found that the new companies want that stuff. You want a Google office in Washington, D.C., you better have a lead platinum building because otherwise they won't come. It's a competitive advantage in this very tight economic world to deliver this kind of amenity to the people who want to live, work, visit, and play in your city. So it's not only that the stakes are big because of how much of our money is spending. In my humble opinion, it's a competition that's actually quite cutthroat of whether or not these cities are going to survive. And I personally believe some cities aren't, or they're going to shrink to be some, look and be something completely different than they were in the past. But in the district, we feel like what's before us is the chance. And we want to diversify. Of course, you know the business in the district, unlike Pittsburgh or Cleveland or Detroit, our business isn't going to go anywhere. We're not going to lose <laughs> steel production or car production. Government is going to keep going. Nonetheless, we want to diversify our economy. We don't want to rely on just government expenditures. We've got so many smart young people coming already. Now the arts are starting to take off. Now we have computer companies that want to come in, software companies. Absolutely. Once you get a critical mass of talent, then you start rolling forward and building a diversified, powerful economy in a vibrant city. That's what we want. And along the way, we, sh we shrink our carbon footprint. We allow people to be, live happier and healthier. We allow them to walk more, take more public transportation, ride bikes, see their friends, go to the art museum. All these other benefits that will just come from the pattern of development that we support. And changing the landscape that is surrounding us is absolutely integral to that, as well as, and I'll stop on this, I do fundamentally believe that every great city, every great city, is known in part for the water bodies in its midst. In its midst. And having beautiful, clean rivers or oceanfront before us is one of the great attributes of cities 
I don't know about you, I love the sound of running water. I'll go down by the Anacostia anytime I can if I have a choice. And it's amazing how many people are drawn to it. And we need clean water as well. I believe that in the 70s, when we put in the Clean Water Act, this great success, concrete and steel solutions were the answer, and it was successful. Now, in this generation, the question is, can we evolve to the next generation of solutions that expand the kind of benefits we get from just the water quality one, which is vital to energy, air, habitat, farmland, community, finances, economy, jobs, meaningful lives, and take that next step. Now, my judgment, I love what Bernie does. I love Nine Mile Run. I hope you all support these organizations with everything. They're great people and great places. If you're, not, you're all here, so you're probably already involved. But you're, the best things to do is what matters. I'm giving a commencement presentation to GW this Saturday. And I always say there's three things that I think make a meaningful life or job. One is do something that matters. This matters. Two, do something that's fun and interesting. This is fun and interesting. And three, do it with people you like. And there's great people doing this work. I've met them. We've got a cool city. You're on the brink. Some would say you're there, but we're never there. Because it could always change. We, are, we all know that. People in Clevelanders and folks from Pittsburgh know that maybe most of all. But you've got this choice before you. I'm not presupposing the answer to the choice. Other than it would behoove any place to make sure before you make a multi-billion dollar investment. Good God, it just still amazes me to think of that scale of investment in any other sector. We're going to do that in the arts. We're going to do that for economic development. We're going to do that for any other thing. It would blow everybody's mind. And yet it happens in the infrastructure world almost quietly. Before we make that decision in Pittsburgh, or Washington, or New York, where they're thinking about this, or Philadelphia, where they're doing it, or Boston, or Kansas City, Cleveland, all of St. Louis, all these cities are asking the same question. And I, I'm hopeful, and I'm actually impressed with folks here tonight, what I've heard in the, in the meetings I've had, that the opportunity before Pittsburgh, despite the challenges, the opportunity that's before Pittsburgh is one that you can grasp. And that as we say, in so much of this work, it's so great to do this work, you feel like you're on the side of angels. And that's what I think of you all doing this. It matters. We can make this city as beautiful as it's always been, but even more so in the future. So thanks so very much.